Hello everyone, I'm Craig Boswell. Today on Interview 360, the exhilarating and often frustrating work of a wildlife filmmaker, from getting the perfect shots to writing, editing, and producing visually stunning stories that take us all on an adventure. And my guest today produces those adventures. Alex Winchell is here. He has a new project that will air on National Geographic's digital platform. He was also the producer, writer, and editor for Nat Geo Wild's first digital series, Wildlife with Bertie Gregory. We'll come back to Bertie Gregory in just a moment, but welcome to the show. And I want to start off with kind of the things that you focus in on as a filmmaker, because you tend to focus not just on the predator, but other animals that are just as charismatic. Sure. So on television, you have to tell stories with big, sexy animals. You've got to tell stories of lions and tigers and bears. But on the digital platform, you have a little bit more freedom to tell stories about animals that might not get as much coverage. So you're talking about fish, insects, small birds, things that get overlooked because you need to keep people hooked between the commercial breaks on television. I think we were even talking um, a few days ago about how we build now communities on uh, near streams or right. around lakes. So you kind of encourage people to go out and maybe stick their head into the water, and, essentially, right? And take exactly. a look. We think nature exists somewhere else, that it's over in Yellowstone National Park, or it's in Africa, or it's in the ocean by the coral reefs, but it's not. There's nature in every stream, and streams are part of every community. So just going down to a stream, you can find fish, you can find uh, crustaceans like crawfish, you can find birds, you can find small mammals, and most communities try to protect a little border around that stream. So there are natural alleyways of nature in almost everyone's backyard. So I actually spend most of my weekends going down to like local streams and snorkeling with my underwater camera and underwater housing and filming the, the fish down there. And one of the things that I've discovered is that over time the fish get used to me and aren't as afraid of me. Uh, like, this oh, past, it's just Alex, you know, exactly, he's, he's hanging out. Exactly. It's something that we connect with as people. When you see an animal up close, you can't help but empathize with it. That's kind of the problem with talking about animals that aren't in our backyard, is we might care about elephants, but we can't do a lot about that. But if you can convince people that there's a really cool fish in the stream, you can convince people to care. Right. You actually have an impact on your community. And the key is to convince people that that nature is worth protecting. Um, the Wildlife with Bertie Gregory, the show, I believe, was supposed to be four episodes, was it not? And then it just ballooned out. It became uh, very successful. So when Bertie went out there, Bertie was 22 at the time. Uh, he was very, very young, but incredibly talented. My name's Bertie Gregory, and I'm a 22-year-old wildlife cameraman. And Nat Geo wanted to take a risk with them. So they said, all right, why don't you go out there and film these wolves? Because he had experience with them. He'd seen these wolves before. He'd photographed these wolves before. It was something that they thought he could do. But when he got out there, there are so many other animals. There are bears. There are bald eagles. There are orca. They're salmon. They're just a, a wild collection of animals. And four episodes to tell the wolf story became 16 episodes to tell the story of the entire ecosystem. Bertie is one of those people that's just so good. You just, you watch him and you say, I can't help but care about the animal that he cares about. It's going to be absolutely, 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 absolutely incredible. Epic. And he's such a talented shooter that he would send me this footage, and frankly, the stuff that we didn't include in the show was better than a lot of what airs on television. So he, he elevated that production to a level that's just, it's amazing. Um, and that's, that all comes down to Bertie being like a one in a million kind of cameraman talent. And, and that, for someone who may not have seen this show, how would you describe it to them? Yeah, so it's, it's a very, young, modern-feeling version of natural history. And one of the reasons why it feels that way is because we played with graphics on screen and we played with the music that you use to tell that story. We have, rather than your classical orchestra where the music swells as the animal's walking, we have very glitchy, digital feel music. And it totally changes the scope and feel of the show. It's a visually stunning show. It's very exciting in the way that you did this. You produced it. You were the writer, you were the editor. So how did this work? Because he's in far-flung reaches of the world, and then your, your I'm, I'm office based in is... in D.C., yeah. D.C., okay. And then you have to take all of this footage and put together the story. How does that work? 
it's a frustrating experience for me just because I wish that I could be there with the animals, but I'm often not there with the animals. So Birdie would be out in the field, he'd be shooting the footage, and he'd send me a hard drive with 15 terabytes of footage, just an incredible amount of footage that I'd then have to go through and try to figure out, how do we tell these stories? Uh, for Wildlife with Birdie Gregory, there was no one overseeing that project. It was me and Birdie. I was 25 at the time and Birdie was 23. That's not people that you should trust to do a natural, National Geographic show. But because everyone was like, what's the worst that could happen? We got to kind of do whatever we wanted. Or was it kind of like, oh, we sold this show to the boss. Uh-oh, what do we do now? Exactly. That, that legitimately was, was what it was. That's a scary kind of freedom. It's a terrifying kind of freedom. Yeah. Uh, it could have gone really poorly, but it, it didn't. didn't. But it, there's, there's, mm. no, there's no accounting for why it didn't go terribly. It could have gone terribly, and there's, there's nothing I could have done about it. One of the, the episodes I was watching, fantastic episode, he's trying to catch the precise hunting of a bald eagle as it's swooping down and picking up a fish. It's kind of an example of how imprecise we are as humans or as photographers trying to catch this incredible motion and how fast that happens. Yeah, I messed up. And the joy on his face when he actually captures that shot. I nailed it. Right, well you have to remember this was his first assignment with National Geographic. Oh, that was his first. So if he's going out there trying to prove that he can do this, and he's missing a bald eagle catching a fish over and over and over, that's a disaster. That's a situation where he doesn't get a second assignment. Right, that's something you don't tell your boss. Yeah, right. exactly. So Except I got all the this footage. that it's on film. Yeah, right. I got all this footage back, and I was sitting there and saying, what is interesting about this, the bald eagles are very exciting, but what's cool about it and what shows how powerful and impressive they are as hunters is the fact that one of the most talented camera people out there can't get the shot on the first time, can't get the shot on the second time, or the third time. It takes a dozen tries to get the shot. And that's what that episode was about. Right, but it's a nice way of turning that around, turning the, I guess, removing the, right, the fourth wall. Yeah, kind it's, of it's breaking the fourth wall. It's saying that there is a person shooting this footage. Right, it's the way he had to capture this video. It's a waiting game, right? To, to try and capture one shot, or hopefully, even that that animal even shows up. It's an exhausting waiting game, and it's a waiting game that is even more exhausting because when you have to do it. A tedious, tedious waiting game. Someone actually has to be there watching this animal trying to get that shot, and oftentimes the camera's rolling the whole time, so you get animals doing strange behaviors. You get animals stumbling. It's, it's one of the, the most lovely things, and one of the most human things about an animal is when you see it you know, step on a rock and the rock slides from underneath its foot or a branch cracks because you see this realization of, oh no, I've made a horrible mistake. And even though animals don't have eyebrows, they don't have the facial structure that we do, their body transforms in the same way that our body does when we misstep. So you see them tense up, you see them do that little jerk, and that's what like gives you a little window into the mind of what that animal's thinking. And, and one of the things that you're also doing is you're introducing it's a, a new generation of explorer, kind of redefining what an explorer is, right? Or maybe defining what a modern explorer is, particularly in some of your new work. The show that I'm working on now is called Modern Explorer, and it has a totally different National Geographic explorer. It has Ali Zay, and she is an explorer that focuses on how people are impacted by climate change and how they're adapting. And she's joined by an older gentleman named Tom. On this season, we went down to South Georgia and the Falkland Islands. South Georgia is famous because of a man named Ernest Shackleton. And Ernest Shackleton was kind of like the original Apollo 13 story. He and his crew set off to go transect Antarctica and they failed like spectacularly. They headed down to the coastline and their ship was trapped in ice about 50 miles off the coast of Antarctica. And they were trapped there for months and months and months before the ice crushed their ship. And then they didn't have a ship. They were just stuck on the ice and they slowly floated north on the ice for about nine months, just camping in their tents, and they had their little lifeboats with them. And they were able to make a break for land at a place called Elephant Island. And then six of Shackleton's crew members had to make a journey back to South Georgia, 800 miles in a little dinky lifeboat. And they all survived. All 28 people managed to survive that expedition. It took them almost two years, but they survived. And it's not that dissimilar from Apollo 13. So looking back 100 years, that's what exploration was. Tom and Alize are in the present day looking at what exploration is. So what's next then? 
I'm shooting the footage for a new series on backyard wildlife. One of my favorite animals is the squirrel. So the gray squirrel, very common to Washington, D.C., where I, I live. I see them all the time. We look at them, and then we move on. We don't spend enough time thinking about what they're actually up to. Uh, another great, wonderful fact about squirrels is they're better three-dimensional thinkers than dogs are. Uh, when we've put dogs and squirrels in the same study, and this is the study, uh, you have a dog on a rope and there's a pole. The rope stops the dog from reaching a bowl of food. If it went around the pole, it would have enough rope to get the food. But a dog always just continues to strain on that leash because dogs are used to living in a two-dimensional plane. They don't have 3D thinking. Squirrels are because squirrels exist in a world where they climb up trees, they hop from one tree to another, so they can solve that problem really, really easily. And that's another just magical thing that these animals are in our backyard. They're complex problem solvers, and we just need someone to tell that story so that you appreciate the animal that's you know, chirping away in your backyard. Wow, that's excellent. Continued success on all your future endeavors. So happy that you're doing exactly what you want to be doing at this point in your life. Thank you so much. I okay, appreciate you being here. It was a pleasure. And we thank you for watching. Definitely check out Modern Explorers. Check out uh, Wildlife with Bertie Gregory. Well worth your time. Thank you for being here. See you back here next time. This is Interview 360.